If that's not power, then I don't know what is. If that's not a way to honor your dead, then there is no way to honor your dead. That is the most powerful thing that you could possibly imagine. Welcome to Northwoods Kindred. I'm your Goldie Bodvar, and on this channel we discuss all things Asatru Kindred related. So hit that subscribe button if you want to see how we do it in the Northwoods. In this video, we're going to answer a question that I had on TikTok. It's just too much, too much answer for one video on TikTok. So we're going to do it here, and we're going to talk about ancestor veneration. How and why do we honor our ancestors in the modern world? It's coming up. So the, the question was something to the effect of asking, you know, how to set up an altar or a shrine to fallen ancestors, friends, you know, family members. Uh, how would we do that and how do, we, how do we honor our ancestors? If you happen to be adopted or you don't know who your ancestry is for one reason or another, there's actually a, a solution for that. And we're going to cover that a little bit later too, so stick around for that part. For us here at the Northwoods, we honor our ancestors at every single ritual. They are a part of us and they are present for all rituals, whether they be our sambal mini or our bloat. And it's kind of an integral part of our interaction, not only with each other, but with the world around us and our homestead and everything, because we, we tend to set the place up in a way that reminds us of our ancestry as we move through our daily routine. And so we're going to cover some of those things that we do that bring our ancestors to the forefront of our, of our practice and of our thoughts and of our daily routines because I think that the best way to honor our ancestors is remember them and include them in our daily lives. The first thing you have to do if you really want to honor your ancestors is you have to know your ancestors. Um, it's easy to know your, you know your fallen kinsmen and your fallen family members that you grew up with, you know, your cousin or your mom or your dad. Uh, those people are easy to know. It's a lot harder to know those that came long before. Your grandfather's grandfather those are not always accessible to us for any of us because we just there's the geno, genealogically we don't keep track of those sort of things very much some people really do um, and here's a good example of my family my father's side doesn't have any anywhere near this level of commitment but this is my mother's side and this is the Jacobson family history Jacob Jesse and Eugene Jacobson 1722 all the way to 1998 by my aunt Dory Rice and she did the genealogy um, before we had the internet to search when she had to research old documents, check the libraries, travel around, meet people, talk to, talk to people, talk to distant relatives. She traveled to Norway, she traveled to Germany I believe for the German part of the Jacobson tribe and she got to meet all these people and she found a lot of really great pictures. So this is an heirloom for our family for the Jacobson side for our descendants from Norway and I can look back here and I can read these stories of my uncles uh, and you know all the way back and read about their wives and their children and their run-ins with the law and all the little things that they do that make them who they are and it's and it's strangely enough that when I read about their stories a lot of those stories echo in my own story we are of the same bloodline we are of the same people so when I read about how my you know uncle Jacob uh, had a low tolerance for authority figures. I can feel that. I can feel that low tolerance and I can honor that in him um, by keeping my cool when I have to deal with that with those types of, of figureheads. Um, so when I read about them, I can see I can see my ancestry in myself. And if I don't have this book, if I've never seen this book, it's important to note that people are people and that's not any different. Those things that are in you that you that you love and despise, those are still parts of your ancestry. And your grandfathers and your grandfather's grandfathers loved and despised those same things. They, 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 they appreciated the same joys in life and they despised the same conflicts and the same... Because we are of the same people and we are descended from that. So if you don't know who your descendants are, you can still honor them anonymously by giving them things or giving them the attention that you yourself would enjoy and you're probably about a 95% solution to honoring them with something that they would enjoy. So understanding how we are connected to our descendant or to our ancestry anyway, it's, it's important to realize that we can honor them in our daily lives. And I'll give some examples like um, my father, my father passed 20 years ago, roughly, at, uh, just before 9-11 happened. 
and my father and I, we got along really well. And he was he was an he had amazing talent with his hands. He was a taxidermist. Uh, he was he was just addicted to hunting, and he was just a genius mechanic and a welder like you've never seen. They could, he could, he could weld two beer cans together when they still had beer in them. Like it was just that amazing. And so I honor that in craft. So I rarely do a craft where I'm building a knife or or anything like that where I don't think about. Wow, it'd be really nice to build this for my father, or it'd be nice to build one of these things. I don't have to build it and chuck it in the woods and say, that's for you, Pops. You know, just the, the fact that I'm building it and I'm keeping in mind, you know, the things that he would like and, and the joy that he would take in watching me use this talent that was handed down from father to son, uh, that's honoring him. And the same thing goes for my love of hunting. Don't think that I, if I'm out there and I put a shot, a good clean shot on a bear or an elk or a deer, I think of my father when that happens, and my father never had the opportunity to hunt elk, although that was kind of his bucket list thing before he died. He wanted to come to Idaho or Montana and hunt elk. He never had the opportunity to do that. So I carry my father in my heart every time I'm out elk hunting, when I'm stalking around and I'm like, I got to do this right. I got to be stealthy. I got to move slowly. I got to do these things because my father's watching, because he's hunting through me and with me. Those are how kind of the things that I would do to honor my, my own father but I know him well and I knew his passions and his you know and his insecurities and I can honor around those types of things that I don't necessarily have that information on some more distant ancestors now when it comes to my mother my mother recently passed uh, just last year and you know there's a lot of distance between us but I the things that I really remember not necessarily from childhood but more recently in adulthood was that my mother absolutely adored coffee um, you know chain store coffee uh, I won't plug any of them but she absolutely adored her coffee since she probably drank about three of them a day um, she definitely pissed away a small fortune on coffee so if I really want to honor my mom one thing I can do is I can go buy a gourmet coffee which I don't generally do and I can sit outside and I can enjoy it I can sip it maybe even leave some for her out of the cup but the point isn't that I that I waste it or sacrifice it to her the point is that I enjoy it with her in mind she also loved smoking yeah, that was her thing and I would probably could very much sacrifice or offer some tobacco which is a very traditional offering and for a lot of native peoples is tobacco so I could certainly offer tobacco for my mother in her afterlife and I'm sure that that would be appreciated and uh, and well used as well so that's the kind of the, the important kind of the key note with that is that you have to know the people and if you don't know them and if you're just randomly offering to an ancestor then know yourself because they are you and you are they so I don't want to pigeonhole this on just our ancestry and those whose blood we carry because our kinsmen are also very important parts of our lives now we've been fortunate here in the Northwoods kindred we're relatively new kindred and we haven't lost any members of our kindred but we do have two members of the Gallahorn kindred that we've lost along the way and they're very very prized they were prized members of our kindred. They were very valued friends and, and built your own family uh, members. And, and we've lost them along the way. So we also honor them in all of our rituals as well. So the first kinsman I want to talk about is, is one of our older kinsmen, one of the founders of the Gallahorn kindred named Ragnar Loosetooth. And we recently did a Founders Day gathering where we talked about um, some of our revered founders of Asatru and Ragnar being one of the founders of the Gallahorn Kindred came up and we, we talked on him as well. Now I remember the first time I met Ragnar was at uh, a large gathering and Ragnar had this thing where he always sharpened people's knives so he was sitting at a table sharpening knives and he's like hey Bodvar come over here do you know how to steal a knife? And I was like yeah I know how to steal a knife and I picked his knife up off the table and I put it in my pocket and I walked away and he's like whoa 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 and he brought me back and he, and he showed me how to sharpen a knife on a sharpening steel, like a chef's sharpening steel. Of course, I already kind of knew how to do it, but he refined my technique. So I can no longer use a sharpening steel without thinking about Ragnar. And that was better than 20, 25 years ago that that situation took place. But every time I use a sharpening steel, I think about Ragnar. And every time I sharpen a knife or put effort into a knife, I always think about Ragnar and would he approve. So that's a way to honor our ancestors is by putting them into the into our craft and into the work that we do. And another kinsman is Herger or Andy, which was 
probably the best uncle my children have ever seen. Um, Andy died while I was deployed to Afghanistan, and it was a really, really big hit for the kindred. Now, one of the things that we all shared in common was, with, especially with Hawken, myself, and Andy, or Herger, is that we always loved the Big Lebowski. Cult film, absolutely, you know, it was one of the things we would do, sit around and watch the whole movie uh, together and, you know, speak the lines and everything, you know how, you know how that works. So it's a lot of fun for brothers and a kindred to get around, you know, to enjoy things like that together. So Andy, a portion of Andy was sent to us by his family when he was cremated. So that is why we keep him in a Folgers can. And once in a while, if you're, if you're perceptive, when we do a bloat or a ceremony out here, you might see this little Folgers can being held by somebody or standing off in the corner. This is because we're bringing our fallen kinsmen here with us to be a, to continue to take part in our gatherings and in our kinship and our fellowship as it happens, just as it happened when he was a part of it. Now, one thing that's often overlooked is, is our family pets. Uh, you know, our pets are a part of our lives. They're very important to us. They earn a place in our hearts forever. And when they die, which is always way too often because they don't have anywhere near the lifespan that we do, we honor them as well. Now, our old they is like a pet cemetery. We've got dogs and cats and ferrets and rats. <laughs> all, the, all the kids' pets are all there. But you know what? They're not forgotten. They are always come up in, in a ritual, in a summel or a meanie by the kids or by someone else. Like, hey, I remember that time when Scotty did this thing. We bring them up all the time. We think about them all the time. And, and they're still honored. Maybe not, we don't venerate them the way that we do for our ancestors, but we do think about them and we do honor them, you know, because they're an important part of our life. And even though they're just pets, uh, they are family and they do have some effect on us. They do shape us in one way, shape, or form. Through, through the course of our lives, we wouldn't be who we are if it wasn't for the pets that we had along the way. That's a fact. So we can honor them also. We can honor them with how we treat our new pets. We can occasionally leave out a biscuit or a dog cookie as, as a kind of a gift in the afterlife. Like, hey, you know, thanks for being a good girl, you know, for the 20 years that you served us. You know, you can leave those kind of things out and that's a really good way to honor your old pets uh, if you are inclined to do so. Now, we have a video on here in our Just Ritual playlist called Summel and it's a fairly modern ritual. I think it probably came about in the 70s. Um, and it was developed by some pretty crappy characters. But they, there's a lot of history that was pulled from bits and pieces and smashed together to create this ceremony. So the second round of Summel is the meanie or the memory round. So we have since renamed it. So we don't call it a Summel anymore. We call it a meanie. And then it's just three rounds of memory to the gods and goddesses of your choice, to our fallen, and then a, uh, a braggy round at the end. Because I think it's a little bit more traditional to do that, to, to call it that. And we changed the structure slightly. We'll do another video update on that one later. But the point is... Uh, here's the video on the on this, the old summel, and the second round of that is a memory round, and we can do that to a fallen pet or a family member, but that's a way that we honor our fallen at every gathering. Now, in the, the really the beauty of that of that summel or that meanie, if you call it, that second round is really the the bread and butter of that event, and the reason it is is because this is a way that we have that we can mourn our dead that are long dead. So if I just kind of go into my space and I just get all depressed because I miss my dad, well, my dad died over 20 years ago. Um, that just, people don't have any tolerance for that in today's world. They're not like, you know, they're like, get over it. You know, you're, you know he was, he's been gone forever. Like, move on with your life already. Uh, but you and I both know that, that it's not that simple. Um, you know, I've, I've lost children. I've lost both my parents. Um, I've lost really, really close friends. You don't just get over that. And sometimes things come up in your life that makes you uh, relive that trauma, relive that experience and mourn them once again as if it happened yesterday. And that second round of summel, that meanie, that is a point where we can do that, where we can honor them, where I can stand up and I can raise a horn to my father and I can tell a funny story and, you know, and, 
and, and share those experiences with everybody. And this is, I'm gonna tell you some real magic about Summel. We have kinsmen here in the, in the Northwoods Kindred that never ever met this gentleman. They never met this brother. But there have been so many horns raised for him at Summel and Mini Rounds over the years that we have kinsmen that never met him raising a horn to him and thanking him for the impact that he had on our lives that led us to the position where we're at. If that's not power, then I don't know what is. If that's not a way to honor your dead, then there is no way to honor your dead. That is the most powerful thing that you could possibly imagine. And it's, and it's very heartwarming to feel that, to sit in that circle and someone you know has never met this person who is so important to you, but they realize that they were so important to you that that, that person wants to raise a horn and thank them for making you who you are because of the value that you bring to their life. When that whole thing happens, that is magic, and it just doesn't get any better than that. Now, it's entirely possible, uh, and I think within keeping of tradition, is to, to put a little shrine or something in the corner, but I don't think that's the, the be-all, end-all of honoring our ancestors. I think we should really live that honor, not just do it as a ritual once in a while. So you should really live that honor and honor them in your daily lives and honor them in those routines and those crafts and those ceremonies and those things that they enjoyed. You know, if you just pause for a moment and think about them and, and imagine them being there with you, just like I hunt with my father, even though he's been gone for 20 years. Um, my father's always with me on a hunt. Uh, so if you can do that and put them into your daily life, I think that that's gonna go a long way. But if you really want that physical representation, if you want that little shrine, I would say you find a little out of the place where it's not going to get disturbed very often, but a place where you can visit um, often or, or sit down and converse with them, kind of like we have here in our vey. Now, we don't have an indoor thing to our fallen friends and family member, but what we do have is we have a small corner of the vey, and you've probably seen it in some of our rituals. If not, start paying attention because you will. At the end of ritual, we always bless our fallen and our kinsmen from Gallarhorn that are no long, that are not here with us. So we have this special corner, and it's set up with a with an old ship that we put effigies of our fallen kinsmen in uh, and family and, and whatnot. And then we bless them as we bless the rest of our living kinsmen here. And also we have effigies of our living kinsmen that aren't here that are scattered around the country, so that they get some of that blessing as well, and they're a part of. They're a part of everything we have going on here. They're intimately connected to our sacred space. And when they pass, they will be placed into the boat or into the ship with the fallen to transfer to the new location, wherever that may be, uh, and still continue to be honored regularly as part of our family and our kids. And one thing to note is you don't have to spend a lot of money on this. If you know the people, maybe you know their animal fetch, or you know something specific about their personality or about their, their habits or their hobbies, something that represents them. And I would venture to say that anybody that knows the people that we represent here, there's no question about who we're representing with it. If they know that person, they know that that effigy represents them very, very, very well. And that's, that's power. That's... That's what it's about. That's that's the magic in the whole thing is that you can create something or, or build it or buy it at Goodwill. Something you maybe you're you're shopping around at Goodwill and you see this little glass figurine of of a Starbucks cup and you're like, that's my mom's. I'm putting that in the boat. Um, anything like that 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 speaks to you and reminds you of them, a little effigy would be a perfect little thing to put out. To remind you, so every time you see it, every time you walk by it, it says, hey, that's my ancestor, that's my friend, that's my pet, that's the person that I want to venerate. And, and it doesn't have to be expensive and it doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't have to hold a lot of physical value. It just has to hold a memory and has to say, this is who I am. Honor me. Hey, so in case I forgot it, put it down in the comments. Tell us, what do you do to honor your fallen ancestors, pets, family? kinsmen, or anybody else that was important to you in your life that had gone before. May all of your honored fallen continue to bless your life with laughter, happiness, and cherished memories. Thor my friends.